If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we will be looking at verses 1 through 11 of Philippians chapter 3. So, in the world, we have a, a fair distinction between two certain words. And one word that we use today, there's absolutely no biblical concept of that particular word at all. And yet, that's the word that we use so often to de- describe uh, a certain emotion that we feel. Uh, it appears as though today you look to what people are longing for most in life, right? Uh, uh, surveys have given, been given out by Barna Research. And what is it that people want most in life? Well, they want to be happy. Amen. They want to be happy. But interestingly enough, at least the way that we use the word happy, there's no actual biblical concept for that word. How people regularly describe the word happy is a circumstantial emotion. That is, the things going on in our lives determine how we feel. And whenever you're happy, well, that means that all the things are going well. Now, there are times in certain translations that uh, will say certain things like, happy is the man whose quiver is full, talking about, uh, having many children in Psalm 127. Uh, and then some translations in Matthew 5, uh, the Beatitudes will translate what others translate blessed as happy, and that's fair. But the happiness that they're using there is, is different. What the Christian must strive for is not to be happy. The Christian must strive for for joy. For joy. There's a fine distinction between the two. Happiness, again, is, is an emotion brought to us via circumstance. Joy is something far, far deeper than happiness. Joy is something that, despite our circumstances... We're overjoyed. There's a feeling, uh, this insatiable feeling of, of eagerness and anticipation, all the while a confidence that's unexplainable. In our text today, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and his word to them isn't to be happy, his word to them is to rejoice, is to be joyful. We are about to take up and read, but before we do, let us ask for the Lord's help in prayer. Oh, great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this joyful occasion that we can gather together as believers. And though the world around us may be tumultuous, we come here and there is this calm, this peace, this confidence that the one whom we gather together today to worship sits on the throne and is creating all things new. And he clothes us in his righteousness. And by his death, We have been counted heirs of God. Lord, let us preach that to ourself this day. Let us see from your text the joy that you command us to have. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to know your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord from Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Finally, my brothers, be joyful in the Lord. For me to write to you the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware 
of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as pertaining to the law, a Pharisee, as pertaining to zeal, persecuting the church, as pertaining to the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things a loss for the unsurpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, that by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That is the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God. May he add his blessing to it. So Paul here again in the in his letter to the Philippians is, is writing them uh, a thank you letter, uh, a letter from prison as as Paul is in uh, jail at this point in time, and he's writing to them and telling them as he sits in his jail cell, "I want nothing more than to be with you right now, but, but, I'll come soon, and here's a word of encouragement. Here's a word of encouragement." And just previously in uh, the letter, he's um, talking about uh, sending Timothy and Epaphroditus to to come and to minister to the church at Philippi on Paul's behalf. Paul here finally gives his last command to the church at Philippi, the last uh, imperative, the last instruction. Here's what you need to do. And he gives three instructions uh, from this text, three instructions. Uh, Three ways of being joyful. Three keys to being joyful. Point one, be joyful by being careful. I'm going to go ahead and give you the other three because they're very provocative and I want you to sit on the edge of your seats for the rest of the time. (laughs) Point one, be joyful by being careful. Point two, be joyful by being a loser. And point three, be joyful by being dead. I told you they were provocative. Right, and now you're, you're eagerly anticipating. What does he mean by those? I have you where I want you. Okay, good. Um, so first, being joyful by being careful. Verses uh, 2 through 6. Verses 2 through 6. So Paul begins chapter 3 with the command, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Be joyful in the Lord. That's his key. That's the main theme. And then from here, verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the false circumcision. Uh, this word here uh, can also mean mutilation. Uh, he's, he's writing a derogatory term uh, against the, the circumcision party. So if you're, if you're with us on Wednesday nights in particular, um, We've been talking about the the parties of of false teachers, especially within the Galatian church that were telling the people the only means by which you're righteous is to be circumcised, is to keep the law. Faith isn't enough. You need to to keep the law and be circumcised and all these things as well. And Paul here is writing brutally uh, against this party, calling them the mutilation. But look at what he says in verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God by the Spirit. 
These people think that they are the heirs to the kingdom, but they know nothing of the truths of God. Beware of them. Do you want to find joy? You have to be careful. You have to be careful. How do you be careful? First, you must beware of the false teachers, of those who look to to stray and contort the gospel truths of the law. But you also need to know who you are. Do you want to be joyful? Be careful. He describes who we are. We are the true circumcision who worship God by the Spirit, rejoicing in Christ. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Paul here is telling them that there is is no means, there's no work of man's hands that make us righteous in God's sight. But the true worshiper of God is the one who worships God in spirit and in truth. And so Paul is calling this group out who undoubtedly are at the church in Philippi seeking to to turn them astray, seeking to to change their minds, to bring them into this works righteousness party. Paul says, though, that true joy is to worship God rightly, to be careful about how you worship the Lord. Don't worship him falsely, worship him rightly. And how do we do that? He tells us, Being the true circumcision, and this doesn't mean that the physical act of circumcision is is what he's talking about. The the identity of this circumcision that Paul is talking about is, is in the next clause. The true circumcision of God, the true people of God, are the ones who worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Not looking to the things of the flesh to boast in, but looking into Christ and Christ alone. But Paul pushes it even further. He, he says, be careful of those who are teaching false doctrine. But in verses 4 through 6, he also says, be careful of the false teacher that's in your heart. Look at what he says. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more so. Paul is saying here that if anybody in the world has reasons to boast for who they are and what they've done and and the works that they've brought about, it's Paul. And Paul later on will tell us why that's nonsense. And he gives us a description particularly writing against this, this circumcision party who's, who's saying they're justified by these works. He says, uh, if anybody else thinks that they, they should have confidence in the flesh, I have far more. Listen, I was circumcised on the eighth day of uh, the Israelites from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, the strictest of Uh, the Jewish sects of the day, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He's saying that they might think they've done a lot for the the cause of Yahweh. They didn't persecute the church like I did. They didn't take their journeys into their own hands, going far out of their way to guard against false teaching, but I did. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Blameless. Now, that's an audacious statement. Concerning the the actions, the righteousness that comes through the law, blameless, without cause of, 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 um, of any sort of reproach. And yet Paul says that all of these things are nonsense. Utter nonsense. He's telling us, be careful. You want to find true joy? You better watch your heart. And isn't this what we do so often? I think everyone in here 
at some point in your life, at probably some point this week, will look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good person. I know I do. I think all the time, man, if there's, if there's a good Christian in the room, it's me. But mind you, I teach high schoolers, so I probably am. Um, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But Paul is saying here, the human heart does one thing very, very well on its own, and that's self-justification. Watch the human heart as it makes little gods everywhere. The greatest false teacher in the world is not Joel Osteen. It's your heart. I can assure you of that. Your heart can convince you of atrocities. Your heart can tell you that the heart wants what it wants, so go and get it. Your heart can tell you that the things you want to hear and the excuses that you need, and it can convince you of the most um, terrible things. It can blind your eyes. It can deafen your ears. It hardens itself. Paul is telling us to be careful. And why? What's the fundamental reason that Paul goes so far as to say, if there's anybody here in the room who should boast, it's me, and yet I count it all as garbage. Paul is saying, here's the real issue with boasting in your self-righteousness. It's looking to God and saying, I'm a better God than you are, God. Uh, I love hearing funny stories from professors, and I had one one time uh, talking about a research paper that a, a student wrote one time. They bragged to all of their classmates about how wonderful this paper was. It's the best paper this school has ever seen from an undergrad. Um, very well researched, very well thought out. I've come up with new concepts that perhaps no one's discovered before. And the student hands in the paper and the professor's reading through it and grading it and going, this is actually very, very good work. I'm, I'm very impressed. This is good work. And then finally... As they get about midway through, they stop, and the professor puts their pen down and takes a step back and realizes why it's so good. Because it's the professor's work. <laughs> the student had plagiarized, not knowing that it was their professor's work they were plagiarizing. <laughs> yeah, stupid criminals, right? <laughs> so they didn't do very well. But when we boast in our own righteousness, we're far, far worse than that student bragging about how wonderful their paper is. We're looking to the God who is holy, 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 and saying, oh yes, God, but I'm holy too. You know nothing of holiness apart from God. And when we boast in our own righteousness, we do just that. That's what the scriptures tell us. Psalm 97, verse 7, Let all be put to shame who serve the carved images, who boast of their idols. But so often we do just that. We look to how wonderful we think we've crafted our lives, how hard we've put in work, the things that we have, the family that we have, the, the image that we put up on social media to let everybody know that we have it all together. We boast in our idols like no other. We boast in our self-righteousness. We boast that we are the crafters of our own destiny. Let all of them be put to shame. 
But instead, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, I boast in nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what the Christian boasts in. If you want joy, you have to be careful. You have to guard yourself from the false teachers, and you have to guard your own heart. True joy comes by boasting in none other than Christ, because that's the one stable thing we have. Point two, be joyful by being a loser. Be joyful by being a loser. I'll have to define that just a little bit. Look with me, verses seven and eight. But what things were gained to me, these I counted a loss for Christ. Paul had spent his entire life uh, working and striving after perfection under the law. If there was uh, a, a, a prodigy child, I'm sure it was the Apostle Paul, right? In our day, uh, thinking of who Paul was, he was the kid that in kindergarten, they're saying, this kid's going to Harvard one day. And that's just what Paul does. From uh, a young boy in Tarsus, he comes up through the ranks, and by uh, his young adult life, he studied under Gamaliel, the great teacher of Israel that even uh, secular historians talk about from the ancient world, the finest scholar of his day. Paul was no, was no slacker in the world of academics. And he was no slacker in what many would, would perceive at least to be holiness. But his holiness was all wrong. His holiness was something that he grabbed a hold of, that he boasted, in, that he thought, if I can only do this and be perceived as the finest, then I'll be something. I'll have gained something. I'll have high ranking, I'll be well off, I can just be a teacher, I'll never have to worry about anything in my life. And yet all of these things, all of these things that were gained to Paul, he counts as a loss. But look at what he, he counts instead for true gain. Verse 8, Yet indeed, I also count all things a loss for the surpassing work of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. Paul is so serious about his pursuit with Christ that he he gives up everything. Why? For the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Of knowing who Christ is. Do you want to be joyful? You got to give up some things to know who Christ is. Uh, a recent article in the New York Times was written by... Uh, a lady named Hillary Stout, this is back in 2010, and it was talking about uh, the adverse effects that particularly technology has had on people's ability to even relate to one another. And uh, the, the study itself was geared towards more uh, of adolescents and children, how the technology that they've just always known has always been a part of their life has in fact created a, a huge void in their ability to even understand the concept of friendship. And you can see that, right? What, what do you have to do now to, to discipline a child? Well, just take away their phone for 15 minutes and their world shuts down. You can get whatever you want from them. Listen, I need you to take out the garbage can and fix the garbage disposal and, and change my oil while you're at it, and I'm going to take your phone until you do it. And they'll have it done in 30 minutes. It's amazing. I don't know how they figure it out, but they do. And that's because uh, they're, they're so attached to this one thing 
that they, they don't see the world around them. They don't know what they miss from true, deep, intimate friendship. The same is true for the Christian. We are so attached to so many different things, not even bad things, good things. We get so caught up in this thing that we have right here. And we're so, um, we guard it so much and hold on to it and don't let it go. And, and that very thing is usually the thing that keeps us from truly, truly knowing the unsurpassable worth of knowing Christ Jesus. The question is, do you want to be joyful? What are you willing to give up? Do you long to know Christ Jesus in a more intimate fashion, in a more intimate manner? And you got to ask yourself, what are you willing to give up? Regularly, in Scripture, Jesus says, unless you're willing to give up everything and follow me, then you're not worthy of me. We look to the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, and he comes and he he tells Jesus, I, I have kept everything. I, I've kept the law. I want to follow after you. And Jesus, perceiving into his heart, knows that he is a young man of great wealth and has many things. And Jesus tells him, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything you have and follow me. And the young man goes away sorrowfully. And the text says, because he had great wealth. He had one thing that he just couldn't give up, that he just wouldn't let go. And that prevented him from truly knowing Christ. He didn't follow Christ, even. This is a, a hard truth, but the fact of the matter is, unless you love Jesus first and foremost, then you don't really love Jesus. If you don't love Jesus more than fill in the blank, then you don't understand the unsurpassing joy, the unsurpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. And isn't that profound language? Paul doesn't say, I gave up everything. I counted it all as a loss for the unsurpassing worth of being with Christ Jesus. No, he doesn't say that. Of, of Christ Jesus himself. No, he doesn't say that either. The unsurpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, unless you hate your mother or your brother or your sister or your children, you're not worthy to follow me. That's a hard truth. I had, I've seen one seminary professor cry one time. And uh, it was in, in a class on uh, the Synoptic Gospels, and we were looking at that passage in Luke. And he had huge tears in his eyes, and he said, I can't imagine, I can't imagine anybody who doesn't understand who Christ is doing this. I love my children. But if I don't love Christ more, I'm not worthy to follow him. That's a hard truth. That's a hard truth. And yet, that's what Christ says. Do you want true joy? You've got to get your priorities right. You've got to lose some things. You've got to let some things go. 
And that's where you find true joy. The joy of the unsurpassable worth of knowing Christ Jesus. That's true joy. And then finally, point three. Be joyful by being dead. Be joyful by being dead. Verses 9 through 11. Paul says, uh, after explaining that he's counted all things as rubbish, that he may gain Christ. He goes on and says, and to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings by being conformed to his death, that by any means necessary I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul here says that true joy is being found in Christ. And he he qualifies that. What does it mean to be found in Christ? Well, first and foremost, it's as to say, my righteousness is not my own. The thing that I long for most is seeing that my works are not good enough. What a joy. What a joy to finally hear, Paul, you're not good enough. You're good, but you're not good enough. What a relief, says Paul. Finally, I can start living. But the only means by which I can start living is first things first. Paul has to die. Paul has to die to himself. Paul has to die to his self-righteousness. Paul has to wash away, to wipe away, to forget that Paul ever existed and to be first and foremost his identifier as being one in Christ Jesus. What does this righteousness look like that comes through faith in Christ? He wants nothing more than for the Lord to see that he is clothed in Christ, that he might know him, that is Christ, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Do you understand that? Paul is saying, I want nothing more than to be found in somebody. I want nothing more than to be identified with somebody whom the world hated. I want nothing more than to know him, the one that the world hated. I want nothing more than to feel the power of his resurrection. I want nothing more than to share in his sufferings. And to feel the weight of his persecution. Because Paul knows that even amidst that, even amidst the sufferings and all of these things, and the persecution that he will surely face, true joy comes when he longs for Christ the most. And you will rarely long for Christ more than when you stare death in the face. You see it time and time again. Paul says that the first thing we must do to find true joy is to first die to ourselves, the fellowship of his sufferings. And how do these things work? How do I know him? How do I feel the power of his resurrection? How do I see and feel the fellowship of his sufferings? The means by which I do all of that, I have to be conformed into his death. The Greek word there in particular is is painting. It's where we get the idea to morph, to morph something. You're, you're taking, it's like a, the picture of a, a, a piece of clay dough or something like that, and you're, you're working it and crafting it. And Paul says, the means by which I know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings 
is by being morphed into his death. Of all things, the manner in which I'm built up is to be destroyed. The only way that I feel the true power of the resurrection, the only way that I truly know Christ is to first be morphed into his death. And in that, I attain the resurrection of the dead. It's amazing the links that people will go to to have perpetual life, right? One of the, one of the great promises from the New World uh, when, when exploration was going on in North America, this would have been uh, in the late 1500s, early 1600s, was there was a legend that there was the fountain of youth in Florida. And so uh, a man named Ponce de Leon went on a long excursion searching out the fountain of youth because if they could just find the fountain of youth, they could stay young forever. And of course we laugh and think, uh, how foolish. (laughs) But then we look at world around us and how much will people pay for cosmetics for this and that that they might stay young even into uh, let's let's say the late years (laughs) right I I can't tell if you're 40 or 126 but you're somewhere in that range and the spray-on tan's not helping either. Maybe you're part Oompa Loompa. I don't know how that worked, but it's something like that. We will go to the furthest extremes that we should never have to stare death in the face. But Paul says the first place you find joy, the thing that you're looking for, the true fountain of youth, is dying to self. The true fountain of youth is the well of eternal life, the well of living water from John chapter 5. Jesus says time and again in Matthew 16, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your means of a torturous death and come after me. I.e., bidding us come and die. He continues on in Matthew 16, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will save it. It's an upside down kingdom. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. But Christ who lives in me. He says, In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be united to his likeness, in his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Paul says the way to true joy is to die. And it's the most liberating feeling of all. Regularly, our New Year's resolution as I'm going to finally find happiness in myself. True joy, my friends, and my brothers and sisters, is not in self-care. It's not in regular days at the spa. I'm not saying that rest is a bad thing. Definitely rest. Definitely take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, these things. But true joy is not found in self-improvement. True joy is not found in improving your self-identity. True joy is found in dying to who you are and identifying first and foremost as Christ's. 
in Christ alone. Be careful. That's how we are joyful. Be a loser. Give up all things to pursue after Christ. Be joyful by being dead. True joy only comes through the full identifying in Christ Jesus, not in ourselves. Our command, therefore, is to be joyful by being Christ. Let's pray. O oh, great God and Heavenly Father, it is a joyful and solemn truth that we are totally yours. Lord, give us the wisdom, give us the discernment, give us hearts that are able to ask ourselves the difficult questions. Give us a resolution to study your word that by your word we might be renewed, that we might be morphed into Christ Jesus our Lord, that we would turn from our own righteousness and seek after the righteousness that is Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, O oh God, that we might mourn our sin and mortify it and live evermore to you. Give us a burden, Lord, if there be any here today who have not experienced this true joy, who have not felt the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, who have not understood what it is to die to self, Lord, send your Holy Spirit forth and bring them to conviction. Lord, we know that your words never return void. And we give you thanks and glory and honor for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.